my my mother's father and and his wife liked to go to Yellowstone. They they were fishermen, and they introduced my father and mother to Yellowstone. And so my father was a school teacher who uh, got uh, three months off every summer. And so we started going to Yellowstone not only to be with my grandparents, but because my father was an avid fisherman. And so uh, I think my first time up there was when I was one, 1931, and we camped at Fishing Bridge at Yellowstone Park. You could camp, you could put a temp up in those days and, and stay for three months in your tent. And there were hundreds of tents around the lake between the lake and fishing bridges, not very far, a thousand feet or so, and there were tents everywhere. And there was bears at night, bears walking all through those tents. And uh, it was a very popular place. Now, nowadays, you can't fish off a fishing bridge and you can't put a tent over there. So, but we could in those days. And after about, uh, when I was about six or seven years old, my father decided we were gonna camp over in West Yellowstone. And after a couple of years, my father decided that because my grandfather had what they called a cabin camp in those days, uh, later, later they called those things motels, but the cabins were freestanding. Um, and my grandfather was doing pretty good with that, and he had a little pet squirrel that, that all, was always on his shoulder, and he had a leather, leather jacket and, and a, his old hat and a cigar in his mouth and his gray hair and that squirrel. And I remember him walking around. The, and my job as a volunteer was was to cut wood. I don't think he ever paid me, but he said nice things about me, so you know I cut his wood for him. But my father decided that was a pretty good idea, so he'd build a, a cabin camp. But instead of building them, uh, we either traded or I don't know how he got different cabins, but we'd move them over in one in one spot about a block or two from where my grandfather's cabin camp was on, on Boundary Street. Yellowstone Park was 100 feet over there. And, 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 and my father's cabin camp was called Fenhaven. It was just across this little gravel road there. And he moved cabins up together and they'd put them together and knock the wall out. Now this is a two-room cabin. And after a, f a few years, uh, he had, I think, six or seven, maybe eight different cabins to rent to people. And in the daytime, he, he and I were professional fishing guides, and we'd go fishing, and uh, my, mother, uh, my, my mother would rent the cabins out while we were gone during, during the day. And uh, it worked very well in, in the wintertime. Uh, when we got ready to go back to Texas, while well, we'd close up the cabin, put wooden shutters on them because the winters up there can 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 be bitter and we had a lot of things that, that that we didn't want to put in the cabin so on our way home we'd drive into Yellowstone Park about two miles and my father would we had no uh, I think we had no Plymouth or an old Chevrolet like a 1942 Chevrolet or something he would drive off the road about half a mile through the trees over in there and we'd un unpack a trailer that was full of stuff that we didn't want to take to Texas, but we didn't. He didn't want to leave it at at Finhaven. And he'd covered up with a tarp. I mean, there's no airplanes up there, and and nobody out in that country. There's no reason why he shouldn't. Uh, he he learned that that the porcupines could do a number on your things. I mean, they'll chew into anything. They they eat pine trees for a living, and. Uh, People weren't going through Yellowstone Park in the 1940s when the war was on like, like they do today. But we had, we had eight or 10 very special fishing places that we never did tell anybody about. And we could always go to one of those fishing spots and be the only ones there. And, and uh, my father would taught me how to be a professional fishing guide and I, I made uh, 10 bucks a day and you could, take a whole family out there, maybe two families, but we'd, we'd, we'd head out about six o'clock in the morning and we'd catch some fish and then when it got time to eat, I'd, I'd build a fire and, and cook fish in, in a skillet with grease and, and open a can of beans and different, I made French fries and stuff and God, they thought, they thought I was the greatest person in the world. 
but my father always did that and he taught me how to do that and you deep you deep fry trout and catfish i mean that's that's what he did and and the best eating in the world is out on the creek fishing for me meant going out on the river catch two or three fish and go sit under a tree uh, maybe maybe cook a fish for myself as a fishing guide, your concern is for everybody else and not yourself. You have to make sure that your client catches fish, the kids catch fish. Sometimes I'd, I'd catch a fish and hand the rod to some eight or nine year old girl and she'd pull it in and you know, great experiences. And I still, uh, until a few years ago, I still got letters from some of those people. And uh, my, my father had some very important people as fishing guides. Dom Hopkins out of Spokane. His wife was, was the only woman that could carry the National Geographic flag and post it someplace. He a big guy in the Boone and Crockett Club and he made me an official measurer. I was the only one in Arizona that was an official measurer for the Boone and Crockett Club. But with Don Hopkins and my father, they were, they were purest dry fly fishermen. And they'd sit over on the bank on the, on the Madison River in a certain place there the river has moved now, and that, that fishing spot is not there anymore. But they'd sit beside the road there in the evening and watch the, the hatches come on, particularly mayflies. And they'd, they'd watch a, a certain fish. He'd come up for a mayfly, and over here, 10 feet away, he'd come up for And they knew that fish. And whatever the fish was feeding on, my father would sit there and tie a fly to, to duplicate that fly. And then Don Hopkins would get out there in his waders and he had false cast back and forth. He's, he's following that fish, he, see, he sees him, he's come up three times, and then he drops a fly just in front of him and he catches that fish. It's, it's not enough that he catch a fish. He has to catch that fish. That takes it to an extreme. <laughs> you know, when, when the, there are places up there when, the, when that mayfly hatches out and it's always in the evening that those flies come out of the water they hatch in the water and 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 start flying and and you just have to hide behind a tree there, there's so many fish and but in those days we, we we kept so many fish the fish weren't large if you caught a 14 or 15 inch brown trout that's a big fish my, my father there's an old poem my father used to recite Suffer under me to catch so large a fish that even I, when talking of it afterwards, may have no need to lie. <laughs> My father liked that story. <laughs> Today, it, it's, where, where it's ca catch and release in Yellowstone Park, why it's, it, it, frequently you catch 20, 24 inch rainbow and brown trout. Those size fish were unheard of. In, in the rivers up there in those days, you could catch them in the lakes. And and I remember I was fishing on Hebgen Lake one time in a boat out in the middle of the lake. The lake was full of, of weeds, covered the lake. And you couldn't fish a lot of places because you couldn't fish in those weeds. But I found this one spot where the weeds were all around, but there was a, a hole uh, that was not weeded uh, like 10 feet around. And I parked my boat right there and I had a, I just put a brand new woolly worm squirrel tail on my leader and it was not wet so I threw it in there. There was no fish around any place but I threw it in and the thing was floating and I just left it there. In a minute here came a brown trout about six pounds and he took that thing. I have a vivid memory of that. One of, one of the great experiences and I caught that fish. He ran into the weeds and I was very patient. I worked on that fish for 20, 30 minutes. I finally got him out. That was like a, a 20 inch brown trout, a big male that has his, his bottom jaw hooked up. Jesus. <laughs>